today we have a first chapter flash edit for a contemporary mountain man romance. Thanks to the writer for letting us look at the rough draft to give not only you a step-by-step -step in polishing this gem, but also to help others in the process. And in case you're new, Flash Edits are a shorter professional editing service to not only support your budget, but it offers the biggest impact on your writing where you need it most, like first chapters, blurbs, and query letters to hook the reader or the agent. By following these solutions, you can revise the other chapters with the tools you've learned. Let's get started. I always like to start looking at formatting. I can tell the writer knows what she's doing because it's in Times New Roman 12 point font, double spaced, and there's no cover art. Definitely save that for after editors and beta readers because some people like to print it out. For more information on standard for formatting, click the formatting link in the description below. One thing I will say that's missing, page numbers. And lastly, this is not a big deal, but looking at the spacing, it reminds me of a middle grade or YA spacing. Yes, I always prefer easy on the eye spacing compared to dense long paragraphs over and over, but don't be scared to weave in some heavier paragraphs here and there because it really does affect the pacing and the ability to grow an emotional tension between characters, especially for romance. Moving on, let's look at one thing that could potentially throw off readers or agents. It's all the genre, subgenre, and keyword redundancies. Here you have a why choose mountain man romance and also a Robin Hood contemporary retelling. Then you have a trigger warning that is a reverse harem and also again, a retelling of the Robin Hood legend. And then in a prelude, before chapter one even starts, you also have a question about mountain men. And let me check the blurb. Yes, at the bottom of your blurb, you state, Recurve Ridge is a modern day retelling of Robin Hood set in the wilds of upstate New York. It's a hashtag why choose romance. While this all sounds amazing, there is a wonderful audience for all of this, but just consider tightening it up. Which is it? Just because you touch on all these subgenres doesn't mean you need to keep mentioning them. Choose your strongest subgenre and just go with that. Outlander is a good example of a best selling novel that hits several subgenres. First, it's historical, it's fantasy, it's romance, plus, it's about World War II, Scottish Highlander history, and time travel. But it's apparent in the blurb without having to list it in every page leading up to the first page what it's going to be about. Next, let's discuss the prelude. If you've watched my other flash edit first chapters, which I'll tag in the upper right corner, then you know how I feel about prologues and preludes aren't any different. It's nothing that can't really be chapter one for most cases. Do some of my fave books have a prologue? Absolutely. The Last Kingdom has a ridiculously long prologue, but Bernard Cornwell is also the world's most successful historical fiction author of our time. And there is such an abundance of historical context, he doesn't necessarily want to be a part of his starting point. And it just really works for the story. But let's take a quick peek at yours. Okay, no pressure, but just remember, this is basically your opener. This is your first page that people are going to read. So it needs to be amazing. Leaves and sticks crunch beneath my feet as I tour through the forest, their soft crackle becoming a brittle roar in my head. While I love that you started off with a description because it immediately brings us into the story, into the scene, it's a little over descriptive. For one sentence, you have crunch, soft crackle, brittle roar. Just keep it tight. Must get away, can't stop, don't let them catch me. They couldn't catch me, can't, can't, can't. I love internal dialogue, but make it a little less redundant. I couldn't stop, even if my brain had kicked into gear, my body had gone into flight mode, something primitive in my brain activated, numbed everything in its desperate need to survive. I had become its willing host, carrying it away to freedom and safety. There was nothing worse in the woods than him. The monsters all resided in the plush upper class digs, not in our roughened forests like wild men, right? Wrong. Okay, and there it is. So could this be a part of the blurb? Yes. Consider leaving this out. It's not giving us a historical context that's important to the story, and it doesn't have enough of an emotional tug for the reader. So let's start at the beginning of chapter one. Looks like we're gonna start off with a POV from Rogue, which is really exciting, and it's very common for romantic novels to have multiple first-person POVs. 
I stood in the center of my Spartan living room, staring down at the bodies that littered the floor. Ooh, as in dead bodies? I'm getting some dead body vibes here. The air of a faint odor of stale piss of the bottle variety. Ah, drunken bodies. Okay, that's probably what it is. So I just wanna say great job here. Instead of saying I smelled, which a lot of people do for first person point of view, this is great to just go ahead and introduce the senses without saying I smelled something. The air had a faint odor. Love that. It does sound a little strange with stale piss of the bottle variety. Maybe just a stench of whiskey, or if it is piss, just the stale piss of whiskey or whatever they might've been drinking. I don't know. Bottle variety sounds kind of strange. One groaned and I knew they weren't out for good. Still, it annoyed the shit out of me that I couldn't use my own living space. I came out here to be alone, I grumbled. Not end up with a frat party in my house every damn night. And yet, you take in strays with the heart of a philanthropist. Jonathan Littleman pressed a steamy, steamy mug of black coffee into my hand. It hides the devil within. The corner of my lip curled, half in humor, half in a sneer I didn't bother to disguise. We're all damaged goods, unfit for human consumption. As in cannibalism? I mean, the trigger warning did say dark themes, but this is interesting. Of course. But that's why you are who you are, isn't it? Is this a question that he's asking? Robinson Fitzeth Huddington, Earl of the shitful patch of ground, away from everything and everyone we love, rescuer of assholes like myself. John swept his arms out in a circle to encompass the living room, the largest part of my cabin. Okay, let's talk about this. I love the movement here at the end of the sentence. The movement in conversation and dialogue is extremely important and it's often left out. But when two people are talking, there's always something going on. There's either noises or somebody's moving or there's some kind of an emotion being portrayed. And it's really important for the writer to add this. So great job. But I will say, make sure that the dialogue is natural and it's not pushing information onto the reader that a character wouldn't do naturally. It almost feels like there's some forced characterization going on here. The space hadn't been built to confine the bodies of five large men, but we managed. I'd meant to build a larger bunkhouse behind my cabin sometime. Maybe that time had come. I flicked my toe at a beer bottle and it rolled across the floor to bump into a half-empty bottle of cheap whiskey. I would love to know what kind of beer bottle or even what kind of whiskey. It's a great place for characterizing what kind of boozers they are, and it can also root the reader into an era or region. So we're nearing the end of this first page, and I just want to say that I love that you've incorporated dialogue right away, because dialogue shows and characterizes, and that's exactly what it's doing here. So this is great. If they stayed, I'd need to add more than a bunkhouse, maybe another kitchenette, plus their own bathroom. And that meant a trip out of Recurve Ridge into civilization. My stomach protested at the thought. I covered my disquiet by raising my coffee mug. Consider changing this to a better description as this one doesn't quite flow well in the sentence. I get what you're meaning, but maybe just reword. Scolding bitter water tumbled down my throat and I relished the pain. What didn't kill you made you stronger or some bullshit affirmation regular people made up to protect themselves and their materialistic lives. Pain that gave me strength propelled me forward. Every one of us had his own pain and used it, else we were consumed by it. Okay, let's move this up. I like it because it shows his outlook on things, but I would consider deleting this as it's just not very strong prose. I'd served with John and Miller in the Middle East, and the latter retained a desire to address me as Sir, though I no longer had a right to the title. Alan and Will had fallen into our ramshackle life. My lost boys. All of us had thought they were doing the right thing for their loved ones, for society, and had fallen into disgrace for our actions, no matter our intentions. For some unknown reason, these loyal assholes looked to me for protection and decided to stick around and make a hash of my serenity. Okay, this is great exposition. Don't be afraid to make a solid paragraph out of it, since you're talking about robes men. And I get what you mean here, but consider rewording just to make it easier to read. 
because something like this sounds clunky and confusing. It's just a literary term for convoluted sentences. I describe it further on my common mistakes video, which I'll link. Some part of me liked that I had some redeemable qualities because the mission I'd set us on didn't allow for error, only a skewed sense of morality. Okay, you've kind of mentioned a little bit of this in your exposition above, and it's not doing much for the scene at the moment, so I would just go ahead and consider deleting it. Seems a little bit unnecessary for now. We're at the bottom of this page, I just wanna say the exposition is great with its natural transition, it could be expanded further. Um, just as the scene progresses, with sprinkles in, kind of interweaving with his interactions between his men or between his dialogue with Jonathan. It doesn't have to just be this little bit of exposition. So consider expanding on their characterization a little bit so that we really care about Robe and his character. One of the assholes broke wind and his alcohol imbued stupor, just drunken stupor, it's easy to read. That filled my living room with a vile stench. I slugged back my coffee and thrust the cup at John. Make sure they clean up after themselves. I'm out. John said nothing as I stormed from the house. The weight of the ax felt good in my hands as I swung it in a parabolic arc. Through the air, it cracked into the timber around, splitting into a clean splice. I kicked the halves over to the pile I'd already cut and hefted the next. Okay, here would be a great place to paint a picture of the outdoors for your reader. Hair rose on the back of my neck. I stilled my body, half turning to a sound my brain reacted to, but hadn't fully processed yet. All right, so some tension is about to happen. This is an ex-military man though. How would he react to a noise surrounding his house? The irregular stumble of prey being pursued filtered through the trees. So this would be a good place to show you some senses. What does it sound like? Create tension with the five senses and show the emotions of the character. The forest grew dense around my cabin and I never bothered to clear it out. Seclusion being the aim of the game. My feet carried me one step forward, then the next as the panic flurries drew closer. As in his emotional well-being, I wanted to pause and study them. He wanted to study them, as in the panic flurries. But my heart had put together what my mind still thought. The frantic fleeing prey was human. Okay, so consider from a writer's point of view, you have to get to the mindset of Robe. He's this ex-military guy. He's not like other men you've already said right down here, or you will say right down here. Good thing that neither John nor I were your average human. So if that's the case, you need to react as an ex-military man would react and show us that. Nothing else quite made the sound of a desperate person struggling to survive. A black bear lumbering through the Adirondacks in search of its dinner has more grace than a regular person. This location could use a little any time that you have a location name. This also goes for historical titles and historical names. It's good to add some context around it so the reader knows exactly where and what you're talking about. Years of training kicked in. The edges that had been honed to a fine blade throwing off any accumulated crud in an instant. Okay, I'm not sure if this is... Is this a metaphor? Rewrite this, or better yet, if this is how a trained machine would react, make it sound like his instincts kicked into gear straight away. No matter how much booze or time a soldier has had, and especially if he's this mountain man, rugged guy, he knows how to react. And he knows the immediate difference between a bear having dinner, looking for dinner, and a person flailing through the woods. I pace softly to the edge of the clearing, listening for the pursuant sounds, but the panicked fleeing appeared to be a solitary chaos, stumbling on after its predator had long been outrun. Okay, this is a little convoluted. Just consider rewording so it sounds a little bit easier to read. Also, I pace softly to the edge of the clearing. Paint a picture of your setting. This is common for writers writing a scene where tension is building and they forget to show what is in their mind so the reader can see what the writer sees. Side note, a military man or even a hunter would not pace slowly to a clearing. Sending your story through to beta readers will help pick up on these simple inconsistencies. 
For first person POV, it's really essential to know your character and to understand their reactions. Okay, so we're at the bottom of this page and I just wanna say this is a great start to building some tension. And we're gonna talk about tension a lot in this next page. Overall, just make this page a little bit clearer. Just say there was one person running, escaping, then at that point, the tension is built by stating someone appears to be escaping. Focus on just building the tension for this scene. And I'm gonna give you a lot of tips on maybe how to create a little bit more tension. The crashing through the undergrowth didn't have the damage path of a full grown man, which meant it was either a small framed person or a child. The thought finally spurred me into the depths of the forest that had become my home over the past four years. I learned its secrets, but I never divulged my own in turn, relieved of its staunch silent support, the perfect companion. Okay, this bit of exposition actually kills the tension. So let's keep the reader in the moment and consider deleting. The twisting large frame between the close set trees, I strode through the underbrush, less worried for my own silence and more focused on halting the inevitable injury of whoever had entered my woods. Recurve Ridge was a brutal section of the mountain ridge full of rocky outcrops and pitfalls, not to mention my own improvements to the land. All right. I love that we have some setting descriptions, but this should be at the beginning of the scene so that you can root the reader into what's going on. Place them into that forest. A bright flash lit a path the trees. As in a light? Is it dark? And if I see that skin is a way of throwing a light in the darkest places, but I thought you were in the clearing and then why, why are you frowning? Why is Robe frowning? Out of all the tension building emotion that could be used for the character, frowning is just not enough. Is he flushed with excitement? Is he mad at the intrusion? Show us his current emotional state. But it did give me a target to aim for. Aim for what? Do you have for your ax to throw your ax? I studied the flashes, recognizing the dodging pattern the person employed in their flight. The brain most likely well on autopilot at this point. Okay, whose brain are we talking about here? And really, it kind of doesn't matter. Consider deleting and move on with the adrenaline building and impending capture. Okay, so let's stop here for a second and discuss tension a little bit more in detail. Adrenaline is something that the reader lusts for and tension is created by the writer. An example of building tension would be something like this. Have Robe hear sticks crackling in the distance, making him stop mid-swing with the ax. His eyes and ears twitch instinctively in the direction, trying to decipher the distance. And this is why it's important to leave out that prelude because maybe we don't want the reader to know that there's somebody running through the forest and then just gets swept into his arms. You know, let's add some tension, add some adrenaline and trick the reader a little bit. People had predictable patterns built into their systems that showed in their panic. I weaved my way between tree trunks and snagged a flailing arm as it shot past. The body attached to it followed as I swung the arm firmly in a broad arc. It barely missed the next tree tangled in the undergrowth and crashed into mine its flight coming to an end against my chest. Okay, that's a, that's a very wordy description of you could have just grabbed the fleeing body or y'all crash into each other. I pressed my hands to the back of a head of dark hair. What could have been long curls that resembled a hawk's nest tumbling over my hands? Twigs stuck out at haphazard angles as a face turned up to me, revealing a woman in her very early 20s, her pale skin bare beneath my roughened palms. Okay, these two sentences are a little overly dramatic in explanation. Bring more of a panicked excitement to the tone. She was naked, in my arms, a naked woman racing through my woods, staring up at me. Okay, this is a tent shift. Just consider maybe making the first part internal dialogue and then the second sentence say, she stared up at me. Blind panic filled her eyes, her sightless eyes. 
her reality reduced to survival alone. Okay, this is almost head hopping. Just remember this is Rope's perspective. My blood boiled as I stared back at her bare form, utterly unprotected. The woods fell silent around us in an eerie purgatory waiting. Not a single call echoed through the close-knit trees that were usually filled with the soft chatter of my furry and feathered neighbors. Her heart beat fluttered against my fingers in an erratic rhythm that began to slow as her body seemed to accept that she had stopped headlong run to the trees. Okay. Are his hands over his heart or are they still behind her head? And I like that you're giving the reader some great emotional descriptions, but the fact that there hasn't been a natural exchange between them is strange. So there's gotta be some kind of sound, noise. If she is in survival mode and in shock, I can understand her being silent, but how does she know that Robe is safe? Can he at least give her some sort of reassuring words like it's okay or you're safe or are you okay? There needs to be some kind of an exchange between them besides him starting to cradle her naked body. She gulped at the frigid air, frigid air and shallow breaths that probably never made it out of her lungs. Okay, that's unnecessary, but I do like the fact that you have established frigid air. It's good to see what kind of environment we're in. Without thought, I shucked off my jacket and covered her alabaster form. With no visible threat or otherwise, my gaze turned to her to her, and a very different muscle turned over. I traced over her plump, dusky pink lips with my gaze as my mind drew my attention to some, something else. Dark shadows rippled over her skin and something that resembled a handprint with remarkably easy recognition. You can probably just leave it here. And for being somewhat of a predator on my own lands, for perving on her naked form, when I should be protecting her, I hated myself. Okay, I don't love this description, perving, uh, only because what if we changed it to lusting? Perving is not exactly how we want to see the rescuer. Give the reader some heat without the weird vibes. I caught her chin between gentle but rough fingers turning her face to either side in a quick assessment her throat bore similar signs of abuse rising to her cheeks one mark on her shoulder side differed enough in size and landed at a different angle to be from another person the same puzzle of marks covered her torso i didn't need to check her legs to know they were likely covered in the same christ okay i'm not he sure that he would fully really know this, maybe just say possibly from another person to have the reader also consider it too, that there would be more than one abuser, but he doesn't know if this is different angles from multiple beatings or if it was done at once because he wasn't there. She was lucky she'd been able to run, but the body could do amazing things in its hour of need. Her arms were clear of track marks so far as I could see. Either someone had gotten a little overzealous with their impact play, or this girl had been horribly, terrifyingly abused. Okay, again, it's a little strange to not have anything from this character, because it's as if she's just standing there. I mean, is she panting? Is she choking? Is she screaming, whimpering? Is she frantically looking around? Is she unsure of her safety with Robe? Is she realizing that she's naked and tries to frantically cover herself up? And what is he doing? Is he looking around furiously? Is he formulating a plan to grab his men and a bunch of firearms? And she'd ended up in my section of the woods, which meant her pursuer couldn't be far from where I lived. I squelched the need to hunt the fucker down and show him exactly what being the recipient of those bruises felt like. Okay, let's keep creating the tension. I wrapped my jacket around her granite cold skin that was already covered in a cold flush. How long had she been running for? My palms cradled her face, cupping over her bruises with as much gentleness as I could. Though my body had other needs that wanted attention, I squelched those too. What's your name, honey? I murmured. Okay, good. They are finally having an exchange. Have this exchange earlier on. The tension is still there. So keep it going until the end of the chapter. 
It just can't be she's in his arms. Hmm, I wonder what happened, and something's growing between them. Keep the tension going. I mean, what happened? Who is this person, and who was chasing her? So there still needs to be tension here. But her eyes still rolled wildly, and I knew she couldn't hear me or make sense of my words. Slowly, her brain appeared to process the words, though I'd been prepared to hoist her over my shoulder and run her back to the house, though part of me worried that it might not be the best idea placing an abused woman in a small space with a half a dozen large men, regardless which gender had done the damage to her. Okay, this is a really long sentence. And just remember, keeping the tension and excitement going, short sentences are going to help accomplish that feeling. The girl, woman, stared up at me as her navy blue eyes cleared. She blinked once and shifted in my arms the tiniest amount. Her hands cracked across my face, as in she slapped him, her fingers tangling in my beard. I caught her slim fingers in my own hand and held her close as she writhed in my arms, her midnight gaze once again clouded with fear and desperation. A thin, strained keening tore through her throat in a pathetic whimper that clouded my own thoughts with a tempting promise of violence. Keep it simple, keep it flowing, and maybe just say a strained whisper or a dry whisper. What in the hell had happened to this woman and who did I have to kill to make it right? All right, so this is a good finisher. We all want to know what happened to her and we'll turn the page to find out. So there you have it. Overall, you've done a fantastic job. I can't wait to find out what happens in this story. And I love the fact that you have created dialogue, you have multiple POVs, and you have created some tension. It makes for a good start. Now let's go back to the subgenres that we talked about in the beginning. I haven't quite gotten a glimpse of this Robin Hood retelling, which means that it will probably play out in the subsequent chapters, but I will warn you, don't overly advertise this unless you are going to give more glimpses of such an iconic title because we all love Robin Hood and I think that's probably going to be your best selling point on this. Just incorporate it in the beginning of the first chapter, uh, definitely within the first couple of chapters. Just give at least some kind of a glimpse. And I think that could really help with showing some more characterization with Robe. In the beginning, you can give glimpses because I have a feeling he might be our Robin Hood. Okay, and then next, just watch some of your tricky wording and convoluted sentences. Create easier to read flowing sentences. So you can still incorporate clever and figurative language into your style to really move the reader, but you don't have to make it clunky and hard to read. And then also, I would love for you to work on honing in on finding your voice and originality as a writer. This can be really complex and tricky, but I've got some tools to help you in finding your voice as a writer. First of all, it takes years and it takes a lot of practice. Read, read, read so that you know what you like, what you don't like, and what influences you. Because even though we're not trying to copy anyone, a little influence is natural. So first, sit down and choose three words to describe yourself. You might say, I'm a dreamer, I'm an optimist, and I'm very giving. But then ask somebody else to describe you in three words. It's funny how different it might be. They might say, a realist, slightly pessimist, and very witty and funny. So you may think you write one way, but the reader actually is experiencing something else. So the more you realize your reader's experiences with your writing, then the easier it is to actually hone in. And that helps you become a better storyteller. So what is it? Is it your descriptive prose and clever word choice? Is it your own perspective on the story or your tone? Is it your quick, no-nonsense descriptions? Or does the reader get your underlying humor? And ask yourself at the end of this, what kind of writer do you want to be? And make sure you write that down. Lastly, you must write with the intention of creating tone because this is going to establish an emotional bond with your readers. So this is done through syntax and word choices. And I want you to try to use symbolism, metaphors, imagery, juxtaposition, and other literary tools to create your voice. I'll link my literary toolbox so you can incorporate these, print it out, have it on your desk, and these really are crucial elements to help you elevate your writing and find your voice. 
Thanks again. I wish you all the best. And if anybody out there would like their first chapter query letter or blurb edited by a professional editor, drop a message in the comments. I'd love to hear about what you're writing. Cheers.